Hi everyone, welcome to Making Room for Disabled Creators, um, Improving Accessibility for Disabled People in Content Creation. Hello, I am Molly Evans. I have been a content creator and DEI consultant focusing on more inclusion in games for around five or six years now. I am disabled, I have a disability called hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which to keep it short and sweet means that my body doesn't produce collagen correctly. Um, and for me, this causes muscle weakness, joint instability, um, daily pain and fatigue, along with a long list of other symptoms. Um, content creation is becoming an incredibly sought after career among young children, with almost 30% of kids surveyed aspiring to be a YouTuber when they grow up. There are even camps being created in the US specifically to teach children how to be YouTubers. Um, so with this... We know that in the future there are likely to be more teenagers and young adults looking to enter content creation as a serious career path. Being a disabled content creator, um, you start to notice things as I'm sure all disabled people do in their industry. Accessibility in gaming has had a huge push over the last decade and this has enabled more disabled people to get involved and enjoy gaming and game for longer periods of time which is amazing. Gaming brings joy and it brings community and the ideal of gaming and content creation becoming more widespread is that more people could get into it for content creation in gaming. However, gaming content creation has not had the same push for accessibility that gaming itself has had, which is so unfortunate because ideally it would be an amazingly accessible hobby or job for many disabled people. Um, for example, because of the nature of my disabilities being so unpredictable, content creation allows me to make my own schedule, which means I can work around my health. If I'm having a bad pain day or a day where I'm feeling very faint, I can work from bed. If I'm having a day full of fatigue on a Friday, I can take the day off and work on a Saturday instead. I can work from home. I can work in an environment that allows me to be comfortable and I don't have to socialize if I don't feel up to it. Ideally, content creation would be amazing for disabled people because it is so adaptable. As is obvious, getting into content creation as a full-time job is extremely difficult for anyone. However, the systemic issues and lack of access in place for disabled people makes it even more so for us. The assumed attitude of content creation is you hustle and you put every hour you have into creating and posting content and polishing your brand. However, Disabled people may possibly already have less time in their day than a non-disabled person. Between arranging appointments, keeping track of and picking up prescriptions, um, arranging access stuff on transport, planning rest days, managing personal care, maintaining and renewing medical equipment and aids, just to name a few possible items on the disability admin list. With this admin, um, plus the possibility of managing your own health, it means that the idea of hustle culture, something a lot of non-disabled creators push, is almost impossible for a lot of disabled people to adhere to. We may not have the energy or time or the access to commit every waking hour to creating content. However, just to knit this in the bud straight away, you do not need to do this and to burn out for content creation. The algorithms used on social media platforms require you to be constantly putting out content to get views or to gain any kind of discoverability. It's an extremely unhealthy way of working that more often than not is very unfruitful and leads to burnout more than success. Alternatively, I feel like there are many examples of creators publishing less but extremely niche content that is consistently well made. This way the audience knows that they can expect good content and will keep coming back rather than you just becoming a content factory. On YouTube and Twitch, if viewers know they're in for some real good content, there is no need to be constantly streaming or creating videos. Your audience will know they can rely on you for a good time um, and good content and will show up because of that. Although TikTok as a platform doesn't rely on clicks, so it's a little different, um, it relies on watch time, which means if your content is entertaining and well-made or informative, then it will likely have a longer watch time and this will cause TikTok to push it out to a larger audience. Now that we have covered the hustle culture is awful and should never be pushed as the only way to get into content creation, I want to talk about the barriers disabled creators come up against in this space when it comes to making content creation a career and monetizing it. For instance, networking can be an incredibly important part of getting paid, sponsored or collaborative work within content creation. 
Some of this networking can take place online, for example, on X, formerly Twitter. Um, a lot of influencer or community managers will do call outs for content creators to submit themselves for campaigns. However, if that communication in itself is not accessible, this already excludes some disabled creators from putting themselves forward. For example, if the post the people make is uh, has an image or video without alternative or descriptive text, or if the video does not have captions, some disabled people um, won't be able to access that information and so might miss out on opportunities or a chance to excel in this space. Alternatively, Networking in real life can also have its own barriers for disabled people. Gaming conventions are often touted as a great way to meet people within the industry and personally get to know the wonderful public relations people from different games companies. However, getting to and getting around gaming conventions is often extremely exhausting or inaccessible. Um, for one, transport has to be considered, whether public or your own vehicle. If you take your own car, you have to account for the energy it takes to drive and also how far away you have to park and walk to the venue. If you take public transport, which is often a train, you have to call in advance to arrange access staff at each stop. You have to account for the possibility of navigating between different trains or buses. Is it easy to navigate? Is it step free? Um, will you be able to receive help if you need it? Then once you get to the venue, will you have to stand for long periods of time? Will you be able to find the disabled entrance? Is it clearly signposted? Um, will you be able to communicate with staff to receive help? Once you do get inside, you might need to assess the environment and whether it could possibly contribute to overstimulation. Is there enough space between booths to use any necessary aids you might need? Finally, when you make it to the point of networking, it may take a lot of energy uh, to evaluate social cues, to mask and navigate ways of communicating. If all goes well, or even if you're able to network in any way and make it onto a company's PR list, there can possibly be barriers when collaborating with companies this way. Um, PR packages are a very popular way to include content creators in campaign launches. However, <laughs> these often come in large and sometimes heavy boxes sealed with packing tape, which can be difficult for some disabled people to lift, stabilize, and open. Another part of game or product launches are events. Um, being invited to PR events is always a wonderful thing, but again, the accessibility can be hugely lacking and it can be really upsetting. Um, they are often in London, a city that's extremely expensive to travel to, which with disabled ex household expenses um, being often higher than non-disabled households, this may make it difficult for a creator to be able to attend. If you can attend, the venues for PR events are often not wheelchair accessible or step free. Additionally, depending on the event, there can be low lighting, flashing lights, or loud music, uh, which can be difficult for people with low vision, or for people who can get overstimulated, um, or for people with seizure disorders, and this uh, stuff is often not included in information regarding the event. This means more admin for disabled creators in trying to find out every bit of information they can to try and see if it would be safe or possible for them to attend. And I don't mean to list all this stuff out as a way to like point out and yell at companies <laughs> about how they're not making things accessible for disabled creators, but as a way to show the extra layers and extra mental load disabled people often have to carry when it comes to being a content creator. And there are many ways games companies can improve on this and make their campaigns more inclusive of disabled creators. It's not a coincidence that there are so few openly disabled creators at these events or included in marketing campaigns. So here are some possible solutions, though not an exhaustive list. Uh, these are just some of the things that could be considered in making campaigns and this space more accessible and also inclusive of disabled people. First up, in terms of events, covering travel costs for any PR or community events to offset the extra costs we can have as part of being disabled can be incredibly helpful in allowing disabled creators to attend your event. Additional positive of actions like this and one similar is that they don't just help the community, the disabled community alone, but benefit other marginalized and community groups too. Covering travel can help those that live further from major cities, people um, from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, people with kids and carers. Another aspect that we can, can be considered when trying to make PR and networking events more accessible is ensuring that venues are wheelchair accessible and step free or at the very least, being upfront about any physical access issues ahead of events. 
In an ideal world, every building would be accessible. Unfortunately, the reality is that a lot of venues, particularly in cities like London, are not accessible or can't be made accessible. The best thing you can do is always hold your event in an accessible space. However, if there are constraints on the type of space you can use, being upfront about its lack of accessibility is so important. Which leads me on to my next point, communication. Being open about access issues or accessibility in general in your invites about PR events can be incredibly helpful. It means disabled people don't have to add another item to our to-do list to investigate and query whether we can attend your event. Additionally, considering levels of lighting and noise, making sure to have a separate quiet space for some quiet time if anyone needs it can be an incredibly helpful accommodation. And of course, being open and honest and informing creators of noise and light levels ahead of time is also really, really helpful. For instance, if someone experiences overstimulation from noises or lights, they can manage their day beforehand around that knowledge and also be prepared for and possibly bring aids like earplugs or glasses with them. Um, considering the types and variety of food available can also be an incredibly important thing for inclusion. Various types of dietary requirements are often being thought of more and more at events, which is amazing. Um, but the thing less considered um, is different ranges of mobility and strength. As an example, if someone finds holding or using cutlery difficult, finger food might be better. Um, also ensuring there are places to sit and eat are also very important, as I know personally if I'm at an event and I'm using my walking stick um, to keep myself up, but then I'm also holding a plate of food, I'm just standing there with a the plate of food that I cannot eat. <laughs> um, and as I've said before, communication is key. I don't believe anyone in the disabled community expects complete perfection. It would be the ideal and it would be the dream. However, I know that um, complete accessibility is not always likely. So with that, communication is huge. Um, make it known that you're open to any questions about accessibility as no two disabled people's experiences are the same. Please do not make disabled people repeatedly ask for information regarding the accessibility of your event, as is sometimes the case. If your event is not accessible for us, we would rather know upfront than anxiously keep emailing to find out if we're able to attend. Even better, if you can put accessibility information in the initial invite, um, that is one less thing on our plate to do. Um, it might not answer all our questions, but it will be a great help to get an idea. Another solution that I believe is often overlooked is online events. Online events are a great addition to in-person events or an alternative. Uh, we saw them pop up a lot during lockdown as play tests, panels, mask classes, concerts, and they seem to be less common now and only used as like a smaller event rather than the main event. Online events are great for people with fatigue or for those who find traveling difficult for various reasons, and I would love to see more of them as part of game releases or community events. In terms of PR packages, I have seen more companies using pull tabs on their packages, particularly for um, accessible controllers, and it would be amazing if this was the case for PR packages as a whole. Pull tabs can be incredibly helpful for people with low dexterity um, or strength in their hands and arms, um, and also another thing, sending information ahead of time uh, with like weight and dimension info can really help people, uh, for instance, like myself, who struggle to lift large or heavy boxes. So I can ensure I have someone around uh, to help me when it arrives or when I want to film. Um, and also sending a follow up email alongside PR packages with details and descriptions of items inside could be really helpful for people with low vision. Lastly, an important part of all of this is that I implore companies to reach out to disabled creators who may have what is seen as lower metrics. We cannot always participate in the grind or hustle culture or access the means to network. Um, there are so many systemic and health related reasons why disabled creators may not be able to create content as much or in the same way as non-disabled creators, which can possibly lead to lower numbers or less output of content. So outreach to passionate creators as opposed to big creators can be beneficial for disabled creators, but also from a business standpoint, it is so much more beneficial to have someone providing coverage of your game or product who cares about it and is passionate about it. Audience can, audiences can see when someone truly loves what they are talking about or playing. The disabled community, particularly in gaming, is very community focused and so playing a part in that um, can make all the difference for a disabled creator being able to make it in this space. Um, I have been incredibly lucky and privileged to make content creation and freelancing my job. 
It has allowed me to work around my health and also do something I love and am passionate about. And I want to see people, um, disabled people, to be included in this industry and to be able to succeed in it. Gaming is our way of creating and staying connected and being part of a community and we should be able to thrive in this space. Um, and so thank you so much for listening and thank you GACOM for letting me talk about something I'm so passionate about um, and I really hope to see more accessible and inclusive campaigns for creators in the future. Um, if you want to find me online, these are my social media handles and I am always up for talking anything disability or content related.